appreciate you taking the time, Pastor Mark, to uh, join us. Um, as you mentioned, we have folks joining in, and I'm sure we're going to get a few more joining us here as time goes on. They'll, the numbers will click up, but we're joining you from all over the place. We have headquarters in uh, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and we also have a southern headquarters in St. Augustine, Florida, which is where I'm speaking to you from. I'm actually speaking to you from my home office. I have a little one at home who's not feeling so well, so uh, I'm here uh, tending to her, but um, we were going to have our uh, fearless leader, founder uh, of our corporation and uh, CEO, Don Wenner, who was going to lead this, but unfortunately, and we're going to ask you to um, keep him and his family in your prayers as he's currently at the uh, hospice with his grandmother and uh, her final moments. So um, apologies that he's not on with us. He's uh, really was excited to do this, but I'm understanding. So I'm happy to be talking to you, excited for this uh, meeting today. And the group has been um, very excited. Um, I wanna just take a second first to introduce you um, and then introduce our, our, our team as well. Um, but for the group, since it is now, uh, let's see, 103, we'll just jump, dive right in. Uh, Mark Batterson is the author of many books, including one of our all-time favorites, right? Definitely in my top three. I know Don's top five, um, Chase the Lion. Um, we love the book and, you know, we've been reading it for many years here at BLP. Um, we just recently read Win the Day as uh, a team for our Driven for Great greatness group, which we'll talk a little bit now, and that's the group that's on this call here. Um, and then uh, Pastor Mark, um, again, his day job is lead pastor at the National Community Church in Washington, D.C., so uh, we appreciate that, Pastor Mark, and um, he's also a devoted father and husband, so uh, Mark, it's a pleasure to have you here. Well, Thank you so much, Rich and uh, Don. If you get a chance to listen into this a little bit later on, our thoughts and prayers are with you. Uh, and so um, humbled uh, to be with this group. Uh, you know, I, I hang out in a few different circles. Um, you know, I spend some time with pastors, uh, but I'll do a lot of NFL, NBA, MLB kind of chapel. So I love being around athletes um, and I love entrepreneurs. I love the business world, business's mission. Um, in fact, I, I'm going to shoot from the hip a little bit because I, I feel like that's how you add value. You don't think too much about uh, putting things through a filter. Um, but here's a thought up front. We, we received a $14 million gift as a church last year. So I have this philosophy that you don't just plant churches, you start businesses mission and uh, you do everything uh, for the glory of God. Uh, I don't care if you're making movies, writing books, drafting legislation or teaching school. Uh, we do it uh, with the Holy Spirit's help to advance his kingdom. And so uh, my, my day hat is pastoring. Uh, my early morning hat is writing books. And uh, it's just an absolute joy to be with you. And Rich, would it be okay if I share some framing thoughts on when the day, kind of unpack that a little bit, but then leave some time uh, for a little bit of Q&A? Oh, that would be great. If you don't mind, uh, I'd like to take just one second, Pastor Mark, just to introduce um, DLP, right? Um, give yes. you a little bit more color on us. Um, because again, when you look at this group, this is an amazing group, um, you know, right now, the company is 14 years old, and this group has been meeting for about 10 years. Um, so the group is called Driven for Greatness, which is one of our 10 core values. Um, and it means to seek knowledge, which is really what this group is gets together every other Thursday morning to do. Um, and we read all kinds of books. Um, uh, we now have and we're up to about 180 members and growing. Um, and I know it's crazy to think about it, but over the 10 years, um, we've met over 250 times and have read over 100 books. So isn't that wonderful? Wow. Um, wow. Yeah. And we've read Chase the Lion three times at a minimum, at least three times throughout those years. Um, and I know it's one of the things that I do as a ritual. And I was actually, you know, turned on to this by Don himself, reading Chase the Lion over Thanksgiving. Um, so we do that. We do it. Um, pretty faithfully. 
I've also, I must confess, as a side note, I bought Summer's book for my little uh, daughter. I have a six-year-old, so she's, we read God Speaks and Whispers often, so I appreciate that as well. Thank you. Um, so again, this is the team. We're really excited. So yes, please unpack Win the Day for us, and then we'll definitely dive in to uh, some Q&A. So thank you. Wow. Love it. Rich, that really helps. And uh, knowing how much time you invest, uh, I'm, I'm impressed. Leadership starts with, with self-leadership. And we often don't take the time to really care for ourselves, but uh, it's our daily habits that are going to have the greatest impact on the people around us. And honestly, wouldn't it be true that when you think about, uh, uh, what is it, David Brooks talks about eulogy virtues, I think it is. Um, your legacy at the end of the day, what people are going to remember you for are your most pronounced daily habits, I think. Um, part, part of why I say that is, you know, my most prized possession is a Bible that belonged to my grandfather, Elmer Johnson. Uh, the pages are literally taped together, and I can go and see the verses he's underlined. I can see what he's written in the margins. It is my most prized possession. If I had to save one thing from my office, uh, it would be that Bible hands down. And it inspired me to do something. I actually pick up a fresh copy of the Bible in a different translation because the different words make my synapses fire in a little different way. It's the law of requisite variety. The key to growth is routine. But once the routine becomes routine, you have to change the routine. And that's true of spiritual routines as well. And so... Um, I pick up a fresh Bible and I try to read through it uh, every year because I want to have enough Bible someday for my kids and, and grandkids. And so that's a little bit of a tangent right there, but uh, love uh, driven. Uh, I want to get it right, Rich, driven for greatness, for greatness, driven for greatness. Um, okay, we're going to we're going to start on a fun note then. And uh, I promise I'm going to do my very best to add value to your life here um, before that two o'clock hour and trust that there's three or four things that, that could be downloads that are game changers. But when I'm 22 years old, I go and interview uh, for ministerial credentials. And I brushed up on all my theology, my eschatology, my pneumatology, all of my ologies, because I thought they were going to ask me these theological questions but a wise pastor said, if you had to describe yourself in one word, what would it be? Okay, if I asked you that question today, how hard is that to answer? How, and the truth is, all of us are multidimensional. You can't be reduced to one word. But th this is kind of fun. My one word answer at 22 was driven. <laughs> wow! <laughs> and so uh is it any secret that i'm a type three on the enneagram um you know i've i've uh that's how you that's how you write uh 20 books in 15 years you you gotta there has to be a little bit of get up and go um so it tells me a lot about this this group uh, the fact that you're investing that amount of time and energy at self-leadership. And so um, I will, uh, oh, let's do one more thing because we're having fun. Are we having fun yet? Absolutely. Okay. So I'm recording when the day and the sound engineer um, says something so funny to me. He says, because do you remember there's a part in the book where I talk about pseudonyms like John Legend, that's not his real name. <laughs> Vin Diesel, that's not his real name, right? You know? Um, so the sound engineer stops me as I'm recording and says, Hey, in Hollywood, they used to get their stage name by taking their dog's first name, their first pet's first name and their mom's maiden name. And that was their, uh, stage name. And so we're just, we're having a little bit of fun at the outset. I'm going to put mine. I'm going to go first team. Here's mine. I am Muffy Johnson coming at you, uh, today. And so um, I think just for the sake of everybody's edification, I really would like to see, um, and I have to say, Venus Wright is a, a pretty strong, pretty strong start. Caesar, impressive. Um, I like it. So, hey, come on. This is an all play. Uh, jump in, share it. So here's what I want to do. I want to come out, win the day, but I, I don't want to just 
share things that you can simply read from the book. Um, and so let me come at it, but come at it from a little bit different angle. Uh, Duke University study widely cited in any book on habit formation that you can find. Uh, about 45% of our habits are automatic. In other words, we don't really think about them. And that's not just a good thing. It's a God thing. It's the ability to put things on repeat. The, the danger is that when things become second nature, we don't give it a second thought. And so if I were to ask you to kind of break down your morning routine, my guess is that it's so routine that if I said, what time do you set your alarm clock? You could tell me, but if I said, why, why can you answer that question? Now I can answer that question during a writing season. I set my alarm clock earlier because I need to get up and hit the ground writing, if you will. Um, I, I think when I'm not in a writing season, I have this daily Bible reading plan and I have it stack it where I, I get my small latte two shots at the coffee house that's right below me. So I'm at Ebenezer's coffee house on, on Capitol Hill. And I just have to say the Holy Spirit plus caffeine equals awesome. I don't know what your theology is, but I think that's true. Um, and so I, I drink my morning coffee along with uh, my Bible reading, and it's kind of the way that I that I habit stack, and and we all do this intuitively. If you pray before a meal, you're habit stacking. If you listen to podcasts while you commute, you are habit stacking. You know this isn't really rocket science, but it's about intentionality. It's about reverse engineering because whatever goal you're going after, whatever uh, habit you're trying to break or build, you have to you have to break it down. So uh, in the book, I share a. a pretty amazing story. I had asthma for 40 years and I experienced a miracle. I have not touched an inhaler in 1,695 days. And I ran the Chicago Marathon to celebrate that, but I didn't just go out and run the marathon. I downloaded a training plan. Let me see who, who's run a marathon. Let me see your hands. Don't be shy. See those hands. Okay, Rich, you're in. I see Bo. Um, I only have it. I can't get to all the screens. Any any other? Let me just see. Um, yeah. So, uh, uh, 72 training runs covering 475 miles. That's that's how over six months I had to turn it into a habit. And so, to me, show me your habits. I'll show you your future. And these range all across the board. And so with that, let me talk a little bit about these seven habits. And if you know me, you, you know I, I like saying things that, that maybe are slightly more memorable than your average sayings. <laughs> and so I had a little bit of fun with these seven habits and we'll touch on a couple of them. Uh, Lady Mullins, I'm just going to start calling people out. Be Benji Quinn, um, <laughs> <laughs> Honey Girl Grant. Yeah, we're just going to, we're going to have some fun with a few of these, uh, these habits. So uh, number one, flip the script. I, I do want to take a moment here and, and just say that we think of habits as those external things that increase productivity or efficiency. And, and certainly, you know, there is that dimension of habit formation, but it's these internal habits, mental habits that are, that are so critical. If you want to change your life, you have to change your story. It's a second law of cybernetics. Like the first law is you do something more or less, and that's great. But at the end of the day, it has to be our identity. And, uh, and that is so absolutely critical because a lot of people put a lot of labels on us. And if you aren't careful, you let culture name you or tame you. But at the end of the day, I am who God says I am. I happen to believe that. And so to me, scripture is our script cure. And, and I'm throwing um, some spiritual language, some biblical language. And, and I realize that there might be some spectrum here kind of on the, on the faith matrix, if you will. Um, and I want you to hear my heart today. This is just me kind of coming from my experience uh, and the life that I've lived. And so that's all I know. So that's, that's what you're going to get from this guy right, right here is, who is still, by the way, uh, very much a work 
in progress. And so I think scripture is our script cure. And uh, if you don't like your life, you, you've got to tell yourself a different story. So about 60,000 thoughts every day, according to the Cleveland Clinic, about 80% of them negative. And so what we have to begin to do is realize that our explanations are more important than our experiences. This is true psychologically and theologically. You know, Martin Seligman would call it your explanatory style. But I immediately would go to Genesis 50, 20. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, the saving of many lives. And so there, there are always two narratives at play. There's kind of what's happening in real time, but it's critical with that first habit that we're explaining things to ourselves the right way. And so let me just ask a question with an obvious answer. And uh, I'll pick on, on a few more people. You don't actually have to, to answer, but Tex Freeman, uh, <laughs> Muffin <laughs> Dennis, I can't even say it without laughing. Um, and uh, Bogey, Bogey, uh, I'll hypothetically ask you this question. Do you feel like your seven-year-old self had the capacity to explain to you the complexity of what was happening in your life at seven years old? There's no way. Um, if you walk through a tough circumstance, you experience tragedy or loss or a, a family structure breaks apart, like at seven years old, you don't really have the capacity to explain that to yourself. And so uh, to steal a page out of Malcolm Gladwell, I do think you have to do some revisionist history. And I don't mean changing the facts. I, I mean going back and trying to understand it from the far side of the cross, from the far side of the empty tomb, and kind of getting perspective, almost third-person perspective on your life. Um, there are lots of ways to do this. I did a life plan a couple of years ago. Wow, that will fast track it. But I think it's doing exactly what you're doing on these calls. It's, it's just having a high level of self-awareness. And so uh, flip the script. I probably spend a little bit more time on that than a few of the others just because it's so mission critical. Am I right? Maybe just give me a nod. If you don't get this right up here and in here, it, it's a losing battle. And so um, flip the script. Uh, habit number two, kiss the wave. Uh, I'll, I'll just make a comment here. You know, it's a, it's a famous Marcus Aurelius. The obstacle is, is not the enemy. The obstacle is the way. Um, but let me, let me make it very personal. Uh, 2017, my wife, Laura, uh, diagnosed with uh, breast cancer, stage one, and we got it. She had surgery. We're on the other side of it. She's doing well. Um, but you get a diagnosis like that, and the compass needle spins, and your life kind of turns upside down, and you have to kind of reevaluate everything. And she's reading a piece of poetry that poses a question. And, and I would say next to, can you do it for a day, which is the leading question in chapter one, I, I would say this question is right up there. The, the poetry posed this question, what have you come to teach me? We, we want to move on to the next thing. We want to get out of the situation so we don't get anything out of the situation. A guy named Charles Spurgeon said, I have learned to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages. I will tell you that some of the most valuable moments, some of those most valuable lessons, some of the best days of my life are some of the worst days. You know, July 23, 2000, I should have died. Ruptured intestines, emergency surgery, two days on a respirator, lost 25 pounds. I have the scars to prove it. It took a year of my life. It took a year of my life. But every single day it compounds interest because you don't take life for granted when you've stared death in the face. You, you, you kiss your wife, you hug your kids a little bit differently after that. Unfortunately, so often it takes some kind of diagnosis or near-death experience. So how do we, how do we kiss the wave? You got to learn the lesson, uh, cultivate the, the uh, character and curate the change, um, kiss the wave. Three, eat the frog. Um, 
Mark Twain said, uh, if you ever have to eat a live frog, do it first thing in the morning. Then you'll know that the hardest thing is behind you, which is hilarious and uh, absolutely hypothetical. Uh, if someone has ever eaten a live frog who is not named David Blaine, uh, maybe just don't tell us. Don't even tell us. <laughs> um, this is about front loading uh, those things, that, that the hard things to do. Um, how you start the day sets the tone. And I'll just kind of leave it there. And we can double back to a few of these habits and dive a little bit deeper with Q&A uh, if you, if you want to do that. Uh, habit number four um, is fly the kite. If you do little things like they're big things, got to do big things like they're little things. Don't despise the day of small beginnings. Um, let, let me make it personal. $50 check, 4.7 mile prayer walk, $400 drum set. Those three things in August of 96 absolutely changed the trajectory of my life, changed the trajectory of our church. Um, you know, I, I, I hope you hear this. Like when I share our story, it's not my story. It's God's story. It's a story that God's writing in and through my life, through our life as a church. And so it's a testimony. So when I share it, I'm stewarding it. Um, and testimony is prophecy. If God did it before, he can do it again. And if he did it for me, he can do it for you. So I hope, I hope you hear the heart behind it. Um, we've, uh, we've got a DC Dream Center in Ward 7 that served 55,000 meals last year. We built it for $5.5 million, and it might have the highest ROI of anything we've done. Uh, we've given $25 million to missions. We've taken 273 mission trips. But can I tell you how it started? Uh, a $50 check that you had to about pry out of my hand because we didn't have it to give. But this is where the, the pastor in me comes out because I, I know people who say when I make more, I'll give more. Love you, but I'm not buying what you're selling. Generosity starts right here, right now. If you're faithful with a little, there will be an opportunity to be faithful with a lot. Um, that 4.7 mile prayer walk, I wasn't praying for property, was praying for people. Prayed it around Capitol Hill, by the way. And uh, 25 years later, we own six properties right on that prayer circle worth um, a combined well, at this point, approaching $75, $80 million. I, I promise you when I say that I never thought we would own anything, not with, the, not with the price of real estate in D.C. I really did not. But I will say this. Our mindset has never been to build a church, but to bless a city to the third and fourth generation. And so we've got to have a Jeremiah 29 mindset. you got to plant gardens and build houses you got to seek the peace and prosperity of the city where you live and if you do that then i think god will do something that's a little bit bigger so right now uh and we can come back to this just kind of knowing who's on this call this might be a a point of interest um we bought a city block for 29 million dollars and it was the 1891 navy yard car barn man if those if those walls could talk uh, it is a beautiful, beautiful old building, and uh, it, it is now, um, well, it's, it's lots of different things. Uh, it's uh, an event venue where we gather for one of our seven campuses, and, and then we have a 200-kid um, child development center that's about to open. Uh, it'll be a Monday to Friday revenue stream, but it'll meet a real need in real time. It's one of our mayor's top initiatives. And so we get to uh, have about 200 kids that we impact Monday to Friday, and then we'll use it on the weekend. And then we're looking at um, a mixed-use retail restaurant uh, marketplace. Um, you know, I, I'm trying to think if there's anything up in, in PA like this. I don't know if Philly would have something. But, you know, I'm, I'm thinking Chelsea Market, um, New York City, uh, Pont City Market, Atlanta, Armature Works, Tampa. It's these kind of food hall. Uh, that's what we're looking to create, kind of to create a place where church and community can cross paths and then a, a co-working space. So we're kind of, we're trying to operate outside the box just a little bit. Um, 
All right, I'm going to keep moving fast. Love it. Um, habit number uh, five, cut the rope. Um, a, a great book, by the way. I, I like recommending books um, that are not written by me. Uh, uh, Cal Newport, Deep Work is one of those. Uh, it's really a great, it's a fascinating read. He talks about this idea of grand gestures. And you know what I love? I love reading psychology and neurology. I love reading anything I can get my hands on. I think you know this. I think you know this. Can, can you bring me back, um, Rich, can you bring me back uh, to, to where we are right now? Because I don't want to I don't want to lose uh, the train of thought with grand gesture. I think I'll remember. Absolutely. OK, so. Let me just have uh, interrupt this regularly scheduled Zoom call <laughs> and uh, show me your strong hand. Let me see your strong hand. Um, for, for many of us, probably 90%, it's the right hand. And it, it symbolizes our giftedness, the things that, that we're really good at. And I think God wants to use that strong hand in amazing ways for his kingdom purposes. But then let me see your, your weak hand. Let me see your weak hand. And... Uh, I also believe that God wants to use that we can because that's where his power is made perfect. And so at 22, I feel called to write, but I also take a graduate assessment that shows a low aptitude for writing. In other words, whatever you do, don't write books. Do not inflict that on the world. And, uh, you know, it's funny now at the time, it really shook my confidence because I really felt called to write, but God, God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. And so, I read 3,000 books over 13 years um, before I wrote one. And so I'm grateful that it wasn't a natural gifting because I had to work a little bit harder because I had to read a little bit more. And I think that puts some more in the tank um, because I just, I'm not a guy that can sit down and just like, ha, there's a book. Like that's just not, if, if you knew well, my wife knows I come home during a writing season some days and I'm like, I don't know if I can do this. I mean, I'm book, book 20. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know if we're going to get there. So if you feel like you have uh, something in that we can, but it's something that you really feel like God has maybe tapped you to do, uh, don't, don't give up on it. Like you can't ignore it though. You have to, you have to do something. It's a theory of compensation. Um, but by the way, fun, fun fact. Do you guys like fun facts? I love fun facts. Love them. Yes. We'll, we'll call it fun fact Tuesday. Um, you know, Be Beethoven, um, I'm thinking about it because of Alfred Adler and his theory of compensation that it's where we have perceived disadvantages. It actually, um, it can flip the script and actually become an advantage. It's amazing how many uh, artists have optical anomalies and how many composers have uh, ear conditions. And so Beethoven's one of them. Uh, the Ninth Symphony, which I think um, many uh, who know something about music would call maybe his like Wow, it's right up there in terms of being his best. He was deaf by the time he wrote it. And Amazing. later in his career, um, what they discovered is that his early music was 80% high notes. But the thing that really struck the chord was later in life, he started, he started creating different music. And the argument amongst biographers is that he, he couldn't hear the other music that was being produced anymore. And he had to intuitively kind of listen to the music that was in his head. And he went to some of those lower octaves. And so what was a, a disadvantage, I think in some ways unlocked pieces of his potential. And so, you know, take a long, hard look at the, in the, in the mirror. What are some of those things that pe people would say, no, that's, you can't do that. Um, that's not who you are. Don't, don't be too careful to buy into that narrative, okay? Because at the end of the day, um, I think God loves doing things beyond our ability, beyond our resources, beyond our education, beyond our experience. And I think it's one way that he gets the glory. So that's, that's a little sermon within a sermon. Amen. We'll take it. We're happy you didn't listen to that aptitude test <laughs> or we wouldn't be here today, right? So uh, I love it. Beautiful. So I'm going to bring you back. Grand okay. gesture, Carl Newport, Deep Works. 
Yeah. So the idea is that there are moments in our lives where we have to do something dramatic that often habit formation is incremental, but I think there are moments where you've just got to no, enough is enough or field of dreams, um, which kind of harkens back that $400 drum set. When I went out and bought it in August of 96, we didn't have a drummer felt foolish. Why would you buy a drum set for an imaginary drummer who doesn't exist? But I had felt this prompting uh, that if you buy it, they will come. And uh, sure enough, we've now produced, I think, seven albums. We've got about 150 people on our worship teams across our campuses. But I look back, honestly, I think it was all about that $400 drum set. It was all, you don't have to do something big. In fact, everybody take a deep breath. And let it out. Let me, let me take some pressure off of you. We want to do amazing things for God, but that's not our job. God's the one who does amazing things for us. Our job is to consecrate ourselves, Joshua 3, 5. And if we do our job, God's going to do his job. But at some point, you have to cut the rope. You know, for, for Laura and I, I think one of those things, um, there, there's a few. Giving up a full-ride scholarship at the University of Chicago when I'm, when I'm 19 years old. Man, that did not make sense on paper, but it, I cut the rope, and I think it set the table for me preparing myself for some future opportunities, and, and then Laura and I moving to D.C., packing up everything into a 15-foot U-Haul, uh, no place to live, no guaranteed salary, and so th this is where I want to insert, and by the way, Rich, since Chase the Lion's a book that you guys have uh, done three times, I better say this. I realize after the fact it really should have come with a warning. I should have, I should have done a disclaimer at the front. Like, please don't, don't read the book and quit your job on Monday. At least give it a week. Okay. Because I, I think some people were getting pr pretty fired up, but I also want us to be careful. You, you got to get the green light from God. And, uh, and so you really have to pray through it. And, and there's wisdom in the multitude of counselors, but at some point, you get the idea, you have to cut the rope. And I think that's the habit that for some of you will be the turning point and the tipping point when it comes to kind of going after whatever it is. Well, man, I, I love this. There are decades when nothing happens, said Vladimir Lenin. And there are uh, months when decades happen. But let me up the ante. I like saying... There are days when decades happen. Now, some of you should be nodding already. Who on this call is married? Okay, and who has been married at least one decade? Let me see your hands. Or two, or three. It was a day when decades happened, okay? Um, and if you have children, it's a day when decades happen. And and all of us, and there are lots of dis regardless of marital status. They're, they're just, you only make a few major decisions. You spend the rest of your life managing those major decisions. Um, and uh, that shouldn't put pressure on us, but uh, we should recognize that. All right, let me go quick. Um, wind the clock. Uh, uh, time is measured in minutes. Life is measured in moments. Wow. That is really true. So if I said, how many minutes have you lived? You would have to do some math. Oh, can I share one thing that I love? Um, what I'm trying to do is just kind of, I'm poking the bear. I'm kind of poking at things to just get us a, enough off kilter to, to rethink the way that we approach every day, every week, every year. And so a couple of years ago, I'm doing a, a chapel for Buzz Williams. He was the coach of Virginia Tech at the time. And they're in the Sweet 16 playing Duke Blue Devils. It's been 52 years since they've been there. And I've known Buzz for many years. So, and the game was in DC. So he said, pop over, talk to the team. And then he let me hang around for the film study, which as a former college basketball player was like the highlight of my year. And, uh, and Buzz says something that totally caught me off guard. I can't remember the context, but he said, it was day 1,811 as his coach of the Virginia Tech Hokies. Wow. Okay, Rich, I'm not going to put anybody on the spot, but who on this call can 
tell me right now the exact number of days that you've been on the job. I mean, who does that, right? Like I, now I do know the number of days since God healed my lungs, but my, my point is this, if you want every day to count, why not try counting the days? There's this idea of numbering your days in Psalm 90. And so how, how can you be a little bit more intentional with those days that have been allotted to you? Um, got a friend, Reggie Joyner, who uh, runs this organization called Orange, and they create curriculum for um, kids. And he has this little exercise that if you have a kid who starts kindergarten, um, you, you take a, a jar and you fill it with marbles. And I forget the number. But, but it's the number of marbles between the first day of kindergarten and kind of assuming that, that they pass every grade, um, the number of marbles from the first day of kindergarten to the last day of high school. Isn't that fascinating? That is extremely fascinating. And and so we did I, have a couple of uh, folks who put in the chat box. We had Jean, uh, who had four, 5,483 days since she started, and Anthony Rubin, 1,065. So we have a couple. <laughs> Come on. Hey, I, that's impressive. That's impressive. Um, oh, but, wait. Um, I, I have to pause for one second, Pastor. Yep. And we'll bring you right back to this. But this is Cheryl Craig, who led part one of our Driven for Greatness on Win the Day. She just put in the chat box 47,840 days. 23 years Cheryl. today. 23 years today. Happy anniversary there, Cheryl. Oh, we love it. We love it. You know, this was meant on. to be. <laughs> wow. That's Cheryl. That's amazing. And knowing that I'm taking the baton from you. I love it. We are tag teaming. We are Wonder Twin Powers Activate, Cheryl, if anybody even remembers that old, uh, <laughs> that old little moniker. Hey, that just put a smile on my face. Um, I will say one more thing because I, I, I want part of it is I, I'm letting you into my headspace, which is a little bit of a it's a scary place. It can be a scary place, but um, his mercies are new every morning. Lamentations three twenty three. The Hebrew word for new does not mean again and again. It means different. The mercy that you experience today is different than the, the mercy you experienced yesterday. Think about it in terms of a strain of mercy. And I know we think strain of virus, so it has kind of a negative con connotation. But take your age and years, multiply it by 365, add the number of days since your last birthday. And those are the number of different strains of mercy that you have received from God. That totally changes the mindset, doesn't it? So now every single morning in your gratitude journal, you can, you can write mercy and not yesterday's, but today, today's. Look at that. You guys holding up your gratitude journals. Come on. You are flipping the script. You are putting habit number one into practice. All right, let's, uh, let's touch on habit number seven, and then we'll go uh, do a little bit of dialogue Q&A. Um, uh, seed the clouds. And uh, it's, one of my, it's one of my favorite stories in, in the book. It's, it's actually a marvel of modern science, the ability to, to seed clouds uh, with dry ice and actually produce precipitation. Um, so I share that fun. Can you tell I like history? I like history a lot. Absolutely. I love, I love <laughs> science and I love, I just like interesting stuff. And so um, researching that about the House of Magic, the GE Research Laboratory was fascinating to me. Um, and then it makes me think of Elijah, who, of course, seeded the clouds with prayer seven times. But you got to sow today what you want to see tomorrow. And I feel like I don't need to, I don't need to preach this because you're living it, because you're showing up on these calls. And, and there's a consistency to your effort at self-leadership that is uh, pretty amazing. And so, um, yeah, seed the clouds is habit number seven. We'll kind of leave that one hanging there and maybe we switch gears. Um, hey, everybody, g give yourself a golf clap. Give yourself a golf clap. That, I mean, that's pretty good on a, on a Tuesday afternoon. That's a lot of 
and Zoom, you really have to focus. So well done. Thanks for letting me uh, download some of that. And uh, Rich, I'm happy to, how, I don't know how you normally do your calls, but I'm happy with, with verbal questions, with chat questions. Um, so but, we came prepared. This is the beauty. So we did um, send out a survey to our team members before the call. We have a list of questions here that I'm going to rattle some of them off, but I will invite and say, please, um, if we can get the team, any specific questions you might have, put them in the chat box, right? We'll, we'll do some impromptus as well. Um, but one question, kind of picking up where you left off on your research, right? Um, Patrick asked, um, the fact that you have all these historical facts that you use in the book, they're super interesting, right? And whether it's the Benjamite, uh, ambidextrinists, right? I mean, that's just amazing stuff. The number of swings George Shuba took, um, you know, there's just some great uh, nuggets in all of your books, really. Um, so what's the method you use for researching and compiling these cool facts and weaving them into such a compelling story? <laughs> um, I can't, I don't think I can lower my, my camera, but let's just say that I don't have much of a Dewey dec decibels, um, decimal system. Can you, oh, can you see, all see? The books. no, you can't, you can't really, that, that stack used to go up to, to right here, the, the three stacks of books until about two hours ago. And all of my books fell on the floor in a loud <laughs> thunderous clash, um, or crash. So, uh, Rich, I don't have a neat, clean answer to it. Um, but I will, um, let me see. Hold on. Let me go down the elevator. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, okay, here, here's a great book, Switch by uh, Dan and Chip Heath. Um, uh, I'll just pull this out kind of. So um, you'll see a couple of things here. I never read without a pen. So the shortest pencil is longer than the longest memory, uh, which I think is a Benjamin Franklin. And I underline is level one, circle is level two, asterisk is level three, top leaf is level four, bottom leaf is level five. Maybe I do have a system. I don't think I've ever, I don't <laughs> think I've actually, actually ever shared that. Um, so what, I, but, but when it comes to, I do have a history section, theology, science. And so my bookshelves, but they aren't alphabetical. They're not even by when I read them. Um, and I have, I have a terrible memory for like recalling all of the facts, but I have an unbelievable memory for something I read 20 years ago and a hunch of where it is in the book and even what page it is on and what quadrant top or bottom. There's just, I don't know, my brain has kind of taught itself. And so what I'm good is finding an old book and pulling it off the shelf. And I always have it underlined. And so when I need to go back and read a book, I guess what I'm getting at is you don't have, generally you don't have time to reread the whole thing again. And so I'll, I'll go back. If I only have a few minutes, I'll do the bottom leaves. If I have a little bit more time, I'll do the top leaves. Yep. And so Keep that, that kind of, that is sort of the strategy uh, of how I approach it. And so one little fun fact in that regard, the story about Sir William Osler and daytight compartments. It was a book by Dale Carnegie that turned me on to reading How to Win Friends and Influence People. It was that book in an 800-page biography of Albert Einstein who said, Never Lose a Holy Curiosity. Those two books I read in college, and I became a reader. And Carnegie wrote another book, How to Stop Worrying, I think is the title. And it was in that book that he told a story about Sir William Osler. I remember reading it and thinking to myself, that idea of daytight compartments is really interesting. And so I tucked it away and 20 years later pulled it back out. And of course, it's the opening story. It's kind of the opening organizing metaphor for win the day. So that's kind of, that's sort of how I um, approach books.
super interesting and super cool. We, we, we now see you do have a system, so that's awesome. Um, so, uh, and one of the things I'll say as a side note, um, and I'll get with Jill on this, I would love to share our book list with you, but we'd love to get your book list and, and, a re and just recommendations, any books you recommend, um, because again, we'll read them here in, when the, uh, in our uh, German for Greatness group, so thank you. Um, so continuing with questions, good stuff here. Um, so going to the Bible, right? I mean, there's a lot of biblical references and, you know, again, we're a faith-based company. And so aside from the Bible, which book has the most impact on your life and why? Okay. I'm going to, I love the question. I'm going to answer it in a couple of different ways. When I'm, when I'm 20, 21, 22, right around there, I read a biography of D.L. Moody. And it said that he felt a twinge of guilt if the blacksmiths were up hammering before he was up praying. It's not the most profound book. It's not my favorite book. It's not the book that I like go back and reread all the time. But wouldn't you know it, that one paragraph got, got stuck in my brain. And I kind of just, we don't have any blacksmiths in D.C., we have a lot of military. I can hear the, the morning uh, music. And uh, so, you know, that's a tough question. There are certain writers that I really resonate with. A.W. Tozer, love Tozer. Um, I love uh, Oswald Chambers. And I can drop certain things that they said that are game changers to me. Chambers said, let God be as original with others as he was with you. Tozer said, what comes to mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. Oh, he also said, a low view of God is the cause of 100 lesser evils, and a high view of God is the solution to 10,000 temporal problems. I can't say it any better than that. Um, R.T. Kendall, sometimes greatest opposition, what God wants to do next comes from those who are on the cutting edge of what God did last. And so I, I think everybody ought to kind of have their – their memorized quote list. What is the never lose a holy curiosity, Albert Einstein, criticized by creating Michelangelo. There are certain things that I just, I go back to all the time that become sort of anchors or benchmarks for me. So I'm sort of flipping the question and saying, you know, not just books, but what, what are those one-liners? What are the things that you just come back to over and over again. I think we need a handful of them that uh, kind of form the, the compass needle, uh, so to speak. Amen. And I, I think that's part of, like, for us, it's very equivalent to our core values, right? So when we think of those things that are meaningful and impactful, we go back to, and, that, and one of my favorite core values from our company is being ex, ex stewardship. So I look at it, I'm on the investment side of the business, and being a good steward of our investors' capital, of our employees, of God's gifts and graces to us, right? So, amen, we, we, mm. we all believe in it. You know, Rich, it's interesting because now you're making me gravitate towards biography. Um, although Ivan Pavlov said, if you want to have a new idea, read old books. Um, but it was a biography about J.C. Penney that changed our financial trajectory. Um, we made a decision when we got married that we would never not tithe. That was kind of a given for us, a baseline. But Penny reverse tithe. He live off of 10% and gave 90%. And that's our stated goal. And make no apologies for it. The turning point when it came to life goals for us was, one, going from getting goals to giving goals. It's a whole different mindset. Um, and then adding a relational component to that goal set. So it's a lot more fun running a triathlon with your 13 year old son or swimming the escape from Alcatraz with your daughter. Uh, and so th those are just a couple of kind of quick things that quick hitters that, uh, so it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Just, you know, and I write with kind of this, I have a team of people who praise, Lord, put the right book in the right hands at the right time, because I know that it can be like one paragraph and it cannot even be, I've had people come up to me and say that in a pit with a lion on a snowy day saved their marriage. Rich, I, I, and I've said to myself, like, that was the last thing I was thinking about when I wrote that book. The last, the very last thing. 
And so it's, it's kind of amazing the way books can impact us in tangential ways. Amen. Amen to that. So, so, so you've written a lot of books, right? And you've read thousands. I think it was north of 3,000 books you've read so far, right? So um, now that you've got that craft down, um, again, I, I'm not sure if you're aware of this. I did share with Jill um, that Don just finished writing a book, and we're getting ready to release that here uh, in April. What advice would you give others who want to structure a book and, you know, inspire them to work on writing the book? And then for us specifically, any advice on, you know, how to release the book, right? We're not just releasing the book, but we have our journals that go with it. Um, we have our software that goes with it. Uh, any messages or ways to best impact the world? Yeah, I'll, I'll share it. I'll throw a few things at the wall really quick. And I'm excited about that book. Can't wait to read it. Um, one, uh, C.S. Lewis said, every life is comprised of a few themes. If you're going to write a book, you need to know what those themes are in your life because you're going to need all of the energy you can muster to keep on keeping on. Um, so you have to identify the right theme to write about. Two, um, I, I think it's funny what Tim Ferriss says, write two crappy pages a day. Um, you know, he's famous for that, but I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, what I do, uh, well, and 81% of people want to write a book. So my guess, there are a lot of people on this call who have a book in them. And uh, I'm, I'm excited about that. So um, you have to give yourself a deadline. Let me put that out there. Uh, so I leveraged my 35th uh, birthday as a deadline to finally write a book after 13 years of not being able to pull it off. So if you're, you're at year 12 or 13, welcome to my world in dreaming about writing a book. Um, uh, and then what I do is I, I use my birthday as the beginning of a writing season. So November 5, and then for me, uh, I leverage Super Bowl Sunday as the deadline. I give myself three months. Uh, honestly, it, it's Parkinson's law. If, if you have two weeks, it'll take two weeks. If you have two years, it'll take two years. I, at some point, you have to give yourself a deadline. Then you have to work backwards, reverse engineer it into kind of the, the number of words that you need. And then you have to take yourself, take pressure off of yourself. I'm a perfectionist. So you got to employ an 80% rule. Once it hits 80%, what you think it should be, uh, then hand it off to an editor. Why? Because good writing is is bad writing, well edited. Um, and so, Rich, those are a couple of quick hitters. I, I think we've got to worry a little bit less about agents and publishers these days. It's 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 hard getting a foot in the door. Um, and, and I wish I could say that they were looking for writers, but they're not. They're looking for platforms, and that that kills me, because they're some of the most gifted writers who. Um, it's hard to get a foot in the door if you don't have a platform. But I would say that Amazon has given us a platform and my first book was self-published. So, um, hey, fun, another fun fact. I tried to get it out of circulation, but once it's on Amazon, it's forever. <laughs> um, so, and it was the seedbed for future books because there are two chapters in that book. One uh, titled In a Pit with a Lion on a Snowy Day, another Wild Goose Chase. So, uh, yeah, just, in fact, um, if, you, if you have that inkling to write a book or whatever, whatever that dream is, everything's created twice. The, the first creation is conceived in the right hemisphere of the brain, right? So just kind of everybody put your hand like this. I don't want this to be weird. You don't have to, but if you want to, you can. Just kind of put your hand right here. And Lord, I just, I pray right now for an anointing on the right hemisphere that there would not just be good ideas, but God ideas that you would help our synapses fire in new ways, in different ways, be it a book, be it a business, be it a what, whatever it is, God, I pray for that anointing of the Holy Spirit and uh, just pray your blessing on every single person on this call in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Th thanks for letting me do that. I hope that wasn't weird. Oh, no, like, that was uh, awesome. 
All right. I, I'm going to come back to you in a few months and I'm going to say it was that anointing and that prayer <laughs> that, <laughs> that fired off those great ideas. Uh, so thank you for doing that. So we want to be mindful, um, Pastor Mark, of your time. We know we're running at the end here. We have two quick requests. First is, is there any question that we can answer for you? Anyone on the call, you can pick anyone, myself or anyone, anything we can answer for you. Um, no, I'm just, I'm thrilled that to me, writing is a way that I can spend five or six or seven hours with someone uh, anywhere, anytime, you know, you can take me on a trip. You can take me to the, the beach if you want and books read better on the beach. You can take me to the coffee house. I'll go with you wherever you want to go. But, uh, to me, it's, uh, spending five or six or seven hours and, uh, the only thing I'm going to apologize for is that now my voice is going to be in your head. So, Amen. So, there, so there we'll, we'll ask you, so this is our last request, and I've seen it come through in the chats from several others, but it is my personal request because I, I get asked often um, when, and again, we read the book a few times a year, but we bring up the Lion Chasers Manifesto <laughs> almost in all of our big meetings with big executives, big you know, uh, operators. Yeah, um, it is just the way that we. So, would you mind leaving us with those beautiful words <laughs> and reciting the Lion Chasers Manifesto for us? I would love to. I haven't done this in a minute. So, ready or not, here we go. Quit living as if the purpose of life is to arrive safely at death. Run to the roar. Set God-sized goals, pursue God-ordained passions. Go after a dream that's destined to fail without divine intervention. Stop pointing out problems. Become part of the solution. Stop repeating the past. Start creating the future. Face your fears. Fight for your dreams. Grab opportunity by the main and don't let go. Live like today is the first day and last day of your life burn simple bridges, blaze new trails, live for the applause of nail-scarred hands. Don't let what's wrong with you keep you from worshiping what's right with God. Dare to fail, dare to be different, quit holding out, quit holding back, quit running away, chase the lion. Amen. Oh, that got me fired up. Yes. <laughs> My day is on fire. Pastor Mark, we are so honored and humbled that you spent some time with us today. We look forward to many more of your books to come and we love, look forward to sharing our book with you as well. Thank you. And hey. thank you, Jill. I know you're back there for uh, setting this all up for us. Hey, thank you to each and every one of you, your real name and your stage name. Blessings, everybody. Have a blessed day. Thank you all. all right. Thank you all for joining us. Bye now.